My name is Jennifer Arnold, and I'm a physician here at Texas Children's Hospital. I work in the newborn center in the neonatal intensive care unit, and I also uh, am the medical director of our new pediatric simulation center. I'm Dr. Martin Lauren. I'm a pediatrician at Texas Children's Hospital. I am Ann Stern. I'm one of the executive vice presidents at Texas Children's. My name is Gordon Schutze. I'm a pediatric infectious disease doctor by training, but I'm, my title is vice chairman for educational affairs for the Department of Pediatrics at Baylor College of Medicine at Texas Children's Hospital. I'm Kelly Wallen. I'm the assistant director for the Simulation Center, and in that role, I am sort of the director of operations. One of the things that I have responsibility for is um, the quality and safety program, and um, of course, Simulation Center is a big part of that. Cutting-edge programs are nothing new to Texas Children's, and certainly a simulation center, uh, a large simulation center like we have here, is, uh, is a key component to an, any educational program, really, that's being developed in the United States right now. Simulation in general was started in the 1960s by a man named Dr. Peter Saffer. He teamed up with Asmund Laerdal, a Norwegian toy maker. They developed Recessi Andy, which is our first CPR training mannequin. Since then, just like the aviation world, we realized that we need to go beyond the simulator, that we need to train the whole team. Simulation centers are a new and innovative way uh, to do education and training. The concept of starting a hospital-based simulation center actually started with Dr. Ralph Feigen, our former physician-in-chief, who was a very innovative thinker. Who said, you know, I've heard in other parts of the country and other sort of um, areas of medicine, not pediatrics, they're really using simulation in medicine now in the same ways the airline industry has used it for a long period of time. The vision was to provide a place for training individuals that was safe safe for them, that is the learners, and also safe for the patients. Doctors go to medical school and nurses go to nursing school. Respiratory therapists, they go to respiratory therapy school. Everyone trains in silos. And then all of a sudden you work in a hospital and you have to work together as a team and you have to work in these very high risk situations. The primary goal of using the mannequins here is that in those high risk situations we're prepared, we know how to communicate well, we know how to work together as a team. Being a hospital based multidisciplinary center is what makes our center pretty unique. This simulation center is the state of the art. All the products are very new, all the mannequins are really state of the art. Mannequins that breathe, that turn blue, that have heartbeats and they have pulses and blood pressure and sometimes they cry if they're a child, they talk if they're an adult and so these mannequins are so high-tech that they allow healthcare professionals to practice in a realistic environment. When you're watching it happen you have to sometimes pinch yourself and remind yourself that that's not a real baby on that table and, and I think that's the beauty of it. So that you're immersed in a clinical environment like you would in a real situation, only now you get to practice before you actually have to take care of patients in the real world. Just hang in there, you're doing great. You're getting a lot of pressure? Yeah. So our scenario today is a pretty complex story. Deep breath in again and push. We are going to have an obstetrical team who are going to deliver a baby, something that our OB professionals take care of every day. Yeah. You're doing so well. But then there will be a complication. Unfortunately, it's one of the scariest events that happen in obstetric. All right, what, what's going on, Dr. Leonke? There's a shoulder dystocia. Baby is coming out and all of a sudden gets stuck. Jen, so have you get super pubic pressure? What's it's a pretty high risk situation because it can lead to baby and maternal mortality. The obstetrical team will get to practice how to handle a true shoulder dystocia using our high fidelity mannequin Noel. They will also have to communicate not only with each other, but with a father. So we have a standardized patient acting as dad. So they'll get to practice how they handle the situation in the real world as a team and with a parent or a family member. All right, heading into episiotomy. This baby, just as typically can happen when you have a stressed delivery, will pass meconium, get some into her lungs, and then she'll have respiratory problems. She, she pooped a little bit, and we just want to get that out of her mouth so oh, that we can okay. help her breathe so she doesn't choke on it. Okay. Okay? Sets up to 97. 
Okay, baby's crying. Good. Bart rates 150. She's working awfully hard, isn't she? Yeah. What's that sound? She's struggling a little bit to breathe, so we're just giving her some oxygen. The labor and delivery team, which is practicing as if they're in an outside hospital, will initially stabilize and manage that baby as they would, but then they will realize that this baby needs a higher level care. We're, give, we're giving her oxygen to help her breathe, but she's still struggling quite a bit. To... And so they will actually call Texas Children's Transport Team, our kangaroo crew. Very, very happy for you. We think that it's all okay. We think she needs to come to you at Texas Children's. Hi, guys. Hi. Bridge hey. across. So the kangaroo crew will come and they will be able to stabilize the baby. They'll be able to make sure that the baby has a secure airway before transport. We're weaning her oxygen as we go. And so she seems to appreciate having the support of the ventilator. And then they'll put the baby in a transport warmer. Okay, Dad, we're just going to throw out our hospital here. Put him on an ambulance. Too. Would you like to go ahead and wean? Yeah, let's keep weaning, yeah, because her stats are great. Take the baby back to Texas Children's Newborn Center, where then the neonatal intensive care team will continue to manage the baby. Okay. You okay. guys got some report on her. We had an uneventful transport. Oh, good. With shoulder dystocia, there was meconium at the time of rupture. So there's a lot of action in the control room. What you're trying to do is not only run the mannequins, but you're trying to run the AV equipment and the cameras and the audio. And third, you're trying to pay attention to what the learners are doing in the room. Things are very dynamic, and a healthcare team may take a different direction than you may have actually intended. So you have to be ready to make the changes that you need to in terms of what would be normal physiology for that mannequin. And that's what makes it realistic. Uh, Jim, we're on how much again percentage of oxygen now? 24. 24. I went ahead and put her on. Yeah, we've been. Wow. One of the potential risks of that clinical situation is that some of the meconium gets lodged in a lower airway in the lung and can actually lead to a collapse in the lung, what we call pneumothorax. And the team will then have to decompress that collapsed lung. Oh, another dose of yep. Another 23. Hey, coming up. Oh, good. And ultimately save the baby's life by doing that. Good scenario. Your work is done. If you'd like to meet in debrief A, we will go over the case. A great mentor of mine once said, simulation is just an excuse to debrief. Because truly, that's where all of the participants are going to learn the most. During a simulation, we actually video record and have audio for the whole event. And then the team, with instructors such as myself, we go back to a debriefing room, a conference-style room, where we actually go over the video and we discuss the case. By seeing yourself on the video and having a trained instructor in debriefing guide the learners through that process, you can really learn a tremendous amount. Texas Children's loves to be a leader, and so we're always looking at, you know, what's out there that could help us be better, what's out there that could help us be better teachers, um, better facilitators, um, what's out there that will help us ensure that the care is even safer tomorrow than it is today. Not many institutions have the opportunity to have this extensive type of training um, for their health care providers, and I think this is going to only improve the good care that we currently give, um, and really kind of puts us at the forefront uh, in, in medicine and the ability to provide the safest and most effective uh, patient care that you can.